Hi, and welcome to my webinar on Making Reading Fun, Practical Tips for Promoting Literacy, Motivating Reluctant Readers, and Inspiring Lifelong Reading. Uh, my name is Jennifer Sullivan, and I have worked in public library youth services for over seven years. I also have a blog called Adventures in Storytime and Beyond. And this presentation is adapted from a training that I gave for our local public school system for um, their teachers and aides that work in their after school program. So this is to help school age children um, encourage literacy, develop a positive attitude about reading, and hopefully to promote lifelong reading. And this is appropriate for parents, teachers, and child care workers of school age children. All right, so to start with, why do we want kids to read? Well, obviously there are very functional reasons from day-to-day -day life you need to be able to read, but some of the other things we need to think about are we read to learn information for mental exercise. This is a big reason for the push for summer reading programs to help fight the summer slide and keep their minds active. To reading helps expand language and vocabulary. It also broadens their horizons. They get a chance to learn about other kinds of people, other places, other experiences, and things that they don't see day to day in their own lives. It helps children develop empathy. They see children dealing with difficult situations or just different experiences than what they have. And they under, it helps children to see the impact of different things through another child's eyes. And of course, the reason many of us read, aside from learning information, is purely for entertainment and escape, and that is a very valid reason to read. Now, how can we encourage reading? There are a number of different ways. The first thing we can do is provide a comfortable environment. And you see all these examples are taken from public spaces and libraries and classrooms. I uh, see different types of seating, um, but the environment needs to be comfortable, cozy seating, well lit, not too cold to be uncomfortable, but not so warm either. It makes you sleepy. And make reading fun, not a chore. Encourage reading, but don't pressure or criticize or force it. And keep in mind, reading does not always have to be so serious. Reading can be fun. So fun, silly books are perfectly a good choice for reading. Set an example. Let kids see you read too. Talk about books you've read and enjoyed. Let them see you reading. And be careful to avoid saying anything negative about reading. And then this one is very important to make a variety of materials available, particularly materials with characters they can relate to. So you want to include a variety of genres, fiction, nonfiction, classics, contemporary. You want to be sure to include diverse characters. It's very important for children to not only see people and families and characters that are like them and like their family, they also need to see people that are different from them and situations that are different from theirs. So as you may hear frequently, children need mirrors and windows. So both are very important. So you want diversity. Um, some serious books, some silly, so humor, drama contemporary settings, historical fiction, fantasy, sci-fi, humor, adventure, a little bit of everything, and also a variety of reading levels. If you're looking in a classroom or an after-school setting, child care, you may need a broader range of reading levels. If you're looking um, for a specific child, then you need a narrower range, but they still need some that are on the reading level, some slightly below and some slightly above. Okay, and time. Set aside a time for reading. And this doesn't mean to force them to read for so many minutes every day. This just means to provide the time. Children today are very overscheduled and overstructured, so be sure that they have some time, if not every day, at least very frequently, and particularly on 
weekends and times they're not in school, that they have time where they are not scheduled, where they don't have to do anything, and they can just chill out and read whatever they feel like reading. And one of the most important things is to let them choose. And this is a little exercise to kind of demonstrate uh, the importance of free choice. So these are some books for adults. So I'm going to go over them real quickly and think about one that you might like to read. So the first one is a John Grisham book, you know, a very popular writer, mystery and drama. Uh, the second one, Ready Player One, is a popular sci-fi adventure type book that deals a lot with gaming and has a lot of 80s uh, pop culture trivia and is kind of a quest. Uh, the next one by Nora Roberts is a contemporary romance. And then finally, March is a graphic novel. It's a nonfiction graphic novel that um, tells of some of the things that happened during the civil rights movement. Okay, then on the bottom row from the left, A Higher Call is a nonfiction book set that tells of experiences during World War II um, between an American pilot and a German pilot. Then we have uh, Hearts of Flame by a well-known historical romance writer, Johanna Lindsay, and this is your classic, uh, what we often call bodice rippers. Then we have a memoir from Kevin Hart that is humorous and tells a little of his experiences. And then finally, a nonfiction coffee table type book, uh, Rare Wildflowers of Kentucky with information and lots of photographs. So look over these and think about one that you might like to read or one that is most similar to something you would like to read. Now, of course, I'm not going to expect you to read them, so just pick one. Don't give you a minute. All right, so now have one in mind and I'm going to go through and tell you some of the things about the various choices that I have heard adults say to children about their choices. So if you pick the John Grisham book, well, you know, that's not really the greatest writing in the world. You really should read a, a classic. If you're going to read fiction, read something of value like Moby Dick, which is what, 500 pages? Um, Ready Player One, if you pick that, uh, yeah, that's all about gaming. That's not serious. You need to read, if you want to read about coding and electronics and computers, then get a nonfiction book and go teach yourself to, to write programs. If you chose the contemporary romance, well, we all know romances are just a waste of time. They are just silly and frivolous. So you need to get something that is more significant than that. Now, if you picked March, that's a graphic novel. Graphic novels are not real books. You need to put that back and go get a nonfiction history book that does not have any pictures in it. If you picked Higher Call, um, I think that one is a little bit too hard for you. I don't think you're going to understand it. You need to go find something easier. Now, if you chose Hearts of Flame, the historical romance, well, clearly, you can tell from the cover that is just completely inappropriate. You need to find something better than that. If you chose the memoir by Kevin Hart, eh, he's just a mid-level celebrity comedian. Who cares about reading about him? You need to read about somebody important. So I want you to read this 500-page, very dry biography of George Washington. And then if you pick the nonfiction Wildflower book, well, that has way too many pictures. You need to go find something that doesn't have any pictures. Picture, books with pictures are for babies. All right, I'm sure all of you have realized that these are all very sarcastic comments, but they are based on things that I have personally heard adults say to children. 
So think about how that would make you feel if you have picked out a book that you are really interested in reading. Say you picked out a nonfiction book on a subject that you're really interested in, but an adult told you you had to put it back because it had pictures in it and that you had to pick out a chapter book instead. And I have seen parents do that. And I have heard many, many times I have heard grown-ups tell kids that graphic novels are not real books and make them put them back and get a, quote, real book. So just think about how that affects a child's motivation. If they've picked out a book only to have an adult tell them that their choice is not good enough, is that going to make them motivated to read? No, not at all. And if they're assigned to read something they're not interested in, that they can't relate to, is that going to help their motivation? Uh, of course not. So the, their you know, choice is extremely important. It is one of the single greatest motivating factors in <clears throat> having kids develop into lifelong readers and wanting to read and liking reading. By giving them a choice, you're empowering them, and it gives them a positive attitude about reading. By making a choice, they've actually made a decision. And by making the decision and making the choice, they are taking ownership of their reading, they are more invested in it, and they are engaged. Allowing them to choose and giving them the time to choose encourages readers of every ability and background. And if they are engaged in a book and if they've taken ownership in selecting that book, they are more likely to actually read it and to enjoy reading and find reading worthwhile and more likely to read in the future. And now to reading levels. Uh, I will tell you up front, I am not a big fan of reading levels. They are often overused, misused, and abused. So keep in mind that reading levels are only meant to be a guide. Uh, one of the popular classroom uh, reading levels, there are several. There's Lexile, there's Accelerated Reader, there is the uh, Guided Reading by Fountas and Pinnell, and a couple other more obscure ones, but those are the big three. Now, uh, Lexile in particular is very skewed. It uses an algorithm that is based primarily on sentence leaks and rare words and word frequencies. It does not consider the length of the entire work. It does not consider the content, the maturity or sophistication of the concepts or any of that. And because it is based on sentence length, you can have a book that is poorly edited, that has many long run on sentences, and it will give you a very high reading level, even though it really isn't. Or you can have a book that has a lot of nonsense words in it. And because these are words that Lexile sees as being rare, it automatically rates that as a higher reading level, even though it really isn't. Some examples of some very skewed Lexile scores, um, there is a nonfiction series, uh, Miss, Mrs. Pigwiggle, that you might be familiar with that is usually read, I would say most likely around third grade level, but it has a Lexile score that implies that it is more of a seventh or eighth grade level book. And then there is a picture book called Tiki Tiki Timbo. So you can tell right from the title that it has unusual words in it that are repeated frequently in the story. So even though it is picture book, it's very short, it doesn't have a lot of words, it actually has a Lexile score of a thousand, which is indicating that it's a high school level book, when obviously it isn't. So keep that in mind. Um, children are often assigned to read books that they have to have one and quote their Lexile range. And many higher level readers may score, say, around 1,000 to 1,300 on a Lexile. Well, that's like college textbook level range. And that is not what even adults typically read uh, for pleasure. 
most adult novels are at a Lexile score that is somewhere between fifth and eighth grade. So please keep that in mind. Take it as a grain of salt. And then another popular one is the guided reading by Fountas and Pinnell. And this is one where it, it uses letters of the alphabet to rate different reading levels. And the developers of this system say it was never intended to be used the way it is being used today. It was meant to be a selection aid for teachers and school librarians to help them select books for their classroom. It was children and their parents were never meant to be told that they were a certain level or be limited to a certain level. And this is how it's often used today. Interest is much more important than reading level for leisure and independent reading. And children should not be forced to read at what is supposedly their level all the time or above their level. It is good for them to read a range around their typical reading level. By reading at a lower level, it, it's easier for them. It gives them a chance to feel successful. It makes it more fun. It's not a chore. If you're reading at or above your supposed reading level all the time, that's work. And it makes reading a chore. It makes it something to be dreaded, something that is frustrating. So allow them to read some easier books for fun. That allows them to be successful and reinforces reading as a habit. And uh, another way to gauge reading level that I think typically works better than going by these levels is called the five finger rule. So you, you, the child takes a book, you randomly open it, open it to a page anywhere in the book and ask them to start reading. And you hold up a finger for every word they don't know or they struggle with. Now, if you don't hold up any fingers, then that might be a little too easy for them. If you hold up one or two fingers, it's still on the easy side. But if it's something they really want to read for leisure reading, you know, it's okay every once in a while. Two to three fingers is still a good range for leisure reading. Um, once you get to four to five words that they don't know, that book may be a little too difficult for them, but it might be a good one, a good choice for an adult to read aloud to them or to use with an audiobook because children can typically understand two material that's two levels higher than what they can read for themselves. So just please take reading levels with a grain of salt. Now reluctant readers um, are those who are not interested in reading or who actively avoid reading. Um, and they, they can be reluctant for several different reasons. Um, one, they may have an actual learning disability or learning difference that truly makes reading difficult for them. Some may just have poor reading skills from lack of practice and that becomes a vicious cycle. They, they don't read much so they don't develop their skills which then makes reading more difficult and causes them to avoid it so they never progress and some may actually have decent reading skills but they just have no interest in reading or no time for reading they have too many distractions so keep in mind that a reluctant reader doesn't necessarily have trouble reading so there can be at related to motivation or reading ability. So some of the things that to consider when trying to select books for reluctant readers is they need book they may need books that are very high interest that the content is age appropriate and not too babyish for them, but a lower reading level. And these are frequently re referred to as high-low books, and there are publishers that specialize in these. They need characters and topics that they can relate to. This is a huge reason for lack of interest in many books, particularly um, among children from underrepresented populations. So, so people tend to avoid books that have characters and situations that they can't relate to, especially children. 
Uh, they need a compelling storyline, but it needs to be a, have straightforward plot development. So if you have a lot of time shifting, you know, flashbacks, flash, flash forward, uh, going back and forth in different timelines or frequently changing points of view or both of those things, um, some reluctant readers may have difficulty with that and they need something that has a very straightforward linear plot from one point of view with a really interesting storyline. They may need supportive formatting, so that includes things like illustrations. Um, many readers still need to have some illustrations to provide contextual clues to help them decode and figure out what the sentence says and means. So illustrations are not babyish, many school age readers and older still need to have some illustrations. Other things are spacing. Uh, some, some readers do better when there is more white space on the page. When there is a larger font or a different font, dyslexic readers uh, may need different fonts. There are also different tools to help those with a uh, reading disabilities and differences such as dyslexia that can help them focus and read and helps anchor the letters on the page. They need to have careful introduction of new vocabulary and reinforcement. So if there's a new word in a story, it needs to be used several times in the story to help reinforce that knowledge and give context to it so they can then integrate that into their working vocabulary. And the difficult concepts need to be broken down and reinforced and explained in, with simple sentence structures. And reluctant leaders often benefit from materials that are typically overlooked and undervalued in many cases. So some of these overlooked and undervalued materials, a big one is graphic novels. They are real books, they do have value, and they can be a great way to motivate reluctant readers. Um, the illustrations give them a lot of context and it can particularly help them relate to the emotions and feelings of the characters. They get to see their facial expressions and their interactions. And this can really help readers who have difficulty getting a good understanding just from text alone. And then these can be a great bridge to other kinds of books later, but there are some people who really just prefer graphic novels and read those primarily, and that is fine as well. They are real books. They are more than just superhero books with scantily clad, large-breasted women. Uh, there are all different kinds of graphic novels. It is a format, not a genre. So there are some that, you know, that, that are not comics that tell actually tell a story. Many classic novels and contemporary novels have been uh, republished as graphic novels. There are nonfiction graphic novels such as the March book in our exercise earlier. And these are really good for people who tend to be more visual learners. And then illustrated chapter books. Again, some adults tend to think that pictures are the enemy and that kids have to read books that are just text, no pictures. But many, many readers still need some illustrations to provide those contextual clues. And then silly books with irreverent humor. Adults tend not to like these books, but they can be very beneficial and they highly motivating for kids to read and really helps them develop a positive attitude. So these do serve a purpose and they are great for leisure reading. And actually you can find lesson plans online based on these books. Um, nonfiction is one a lot of people tend not to think about. Uh, the big focus is on graphic, or excuse me, chapter books and fiction. But a lot of kids prefer nonfiction. They like to learn about things and they can cover a variety of topics with younger kids. Animal books tend to be extremely popular. Um, with slightly older school age kids, a lot of the books that have 
humor or just interesting facts like the Ripley's Believe It or Not uh, and things like that and information on other topics and these often do have high quality photographs that kids enjoy looking at. Uh, biographies are another one. There is a series that you may be familiar with that is called the Who Is or Who Was series. And you can see on the slide there is an example. And the covers, the characters kind of look like bobbleheads. This series is hugely popular with kids. Kids come in and they actually ask for those just for leisure reading, not even for school assignments. And there are picture book biographies, there are biographies for you know every age and reading level and some kids really like learning about other people and biographies are a great way to learn about different historical events different places because they're seeing it through another person's eyes rather than just reading a bunch of dry facts and dates and information audiobooks uh, audiobooks are also real reading and some people learn better by listening and as I mentioned earlier, children can understand things that are a couple of levels above what they can actually read for themselves. So by listening to audiobooks, they get get familiar with more advanced vocabulary and language and concepts, and they can listen to an audiobook and read along with it. They're also great for long car trips. And then finally, ebooks. Uh, there are also e audiobooks as well, but with ebooks, and most kids do prefer print, but ebooks do have a purpose and have some unique features that are beneficial for some kids. Uh, you can you know, set the font for whatever size and whatever style font is easier for you to read. Uh, there are dyslexic fonts available now. Um, you can, you know, care have many, many books on one e-reader. You don't have to worry about returning them after, if you've checked them out th through the library, they return themselves, essentially. Um, you can change the colors and contrast on the page. One thing I really like about them is if you are connected to Wi-Fi while you're reading, if there's a word you don't know, you can just put your finger on it and hold it and the definition will pop up and you can also sometimes link to more information that way. So they do have some nice features and that is one thing, another thing to consider. Now some, I'm going to suggest a few specific authors and materials for reluctant readers, but I'm also going to give you a link to a bibliography. Now this bibliography was put together with input from children's librarians from all across the country. Um, I put it together about three years ago, so it doesn't have some of the most recent things on it, but I've got quite a few and I'll just highlight um, it's organized by grade level. Now this list is mostly fiction and graphic novels, but just do keep in mind the you know the nonfiction books and biographies and things like that as well. So some auth some great authors and series for newly beginning independent readers. Um, anything by Mo Willems, the Elephant and Piggy books are hugely popular. The Pigeon series. Uh, there's also the Mercy Watson series by Kate DiCamillo. De, De uh, there are uh, a series of books by Scholastic that are called Branches, and these are really great for emerging readers and newly independent readers. And some of those are The Owl Diaries by Rebecca Elliott, um, let's see, The Chicken Squad series by Doreen Cronin, The Bad Guys by Aaron Blaby. Uh, and there are several others, so you might want to look up those um, for a little bit older children. The Magic Tree House series is hugely popular. Um, there's Princess in Black series, and then Baby Mouse graphic novel series, the Bone graphic novel series, Goosebumps, and as I mentioned before, the Who Is and Who Was biography series. Also, there's a great historical fiction series called the I Survive series that shows different historical events. Um, a lot of them are disasters or wars or things like that, and it shows them through 
through the eyes of someone their age and they're very short so that the some kids who don't like fiction as much or are intimidated by longer books really get into those and there's also some nonfiction books that go with them um, another a couple other graphic novel series are the squish series by Jennifer and Matt Holm uh, Raina Tilgemeyer Til 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 um, books uh, smile sisters and ghost and drama are very popular uh, Victoria Jameson books are really good uh, let's see and then one of my go-to authors for older reluctant readers particularly boys is Gary Paulson he his books are fairly short they're really good for I'd say ages you know 10 to 14 and th the reading level is not particularly low but it's not difficult either but they're very high interest and they're fairly short so they're not as intimidating and the best thing is he writes a number of genres he has several historical fiction several adventure um, even one or two sci-fi and then just some contemporary humorous type things uh, you might know him from the classic hatchet and there are actually several sequels to that and then a modern contemporary author that is very appealing to reluctant readers as well is Kwame Alexander uh, you might know him for the crossover he has several books and the crossover recently came out as a graphic novel version as well and then Mike Lupica writes sports themes books and Tui Sutherland has the Wings of Fire series that are about dragons and Menagerie another series about uh, mythical and fantastical animals so again I'll provide the link to this bibliography below and there's also some citations for some different articles that would be of interest so check those out and then I have some activities to suggest that help support literacy and encourage reading and and may help sneak a little extra reading in so shared reading is the best thing you can do to encourage reading and help a child develop their reading skills and there's many way ways to do that you can read one-on-one -on -one, um, which is typically what you know a parent might do at home or with a reading coach or reading tutor and there are different ways to do that the adult can just read to the child you can take turns reading and there are some books that are published specifically for that uh, there's a series of beginning reader books called I read to you you read to me or something like that that are made specifically for uh, reading together that way there's buddy reading where an older child is paired with a younger child to help them read there's the reading to dogs programs that many libraries have there are different kinds of book clubs teachers can read out loud to the class um, book clubs might all read the same book and discuss it uh, they might just read a few chapters of of the same book or they might read different books and then just meet to talk about what they've read and the the best way to convince a child to give a book a try is to tell them it's very popular with other kids they don't really care what we as adult thinks think they don't care about award winners they don't care how many lists it's on but if other kids like it if other kids suggest it then they will be much more interested in reading it another thing is writers workshops and there's several ways to do this you can give them as you see in the upper left uh, just a bunch of different words to put together to make poems you can give various prompts a written prompt a photographic prompt um, an inspiration a book is an inspiration or you can just let them free write and uh, so that encourages literacy you can even find journals that are based on popular books as you see the one that is clearly inspired by diary of a wimpy kid so there are many different ways to encourage writing uh, performing so 
you know, plays, read your theater skits, and they can act it out themselves. I mean, you can do a full on productions with costumes and set. You can do a simple little classroom readers theater. Uh, you can use puppets, you know, stick figures, you know, any any type of performance for a part or all of a story you can get them involved. Playing word games is a great one. And here are some of the classics, you know, crossword puzzles, the um, word search puzzles, Scrabble, Bananagrams, uh, Boggle. There's a game called Play on Words. So all, all of these games involve knowing words, spelling, reading, vocabulary. So they are really great. Then other games that require you to read instructions. So like you draw a card and you have to read the question and answer it or do what it says. Uh, those are good ways to add reading any other activity that requires reading and understanding and following instructions like cooking or building things, assembling things, anything like that. And that is also a good way to show them that reading really is practical and necessary in everyday life. Uh, some other activities are reading challenges. And this is where you give them a list and it says something like, you know, read a book that was set in the past. Read a book that is set in another country. Uh, read a book with a main character that's an animal. You know, read a book with a main character that is the same age as you. Uh, read a book suggested by a friend. Read a book suggested by a librarian. You know, all these different things. And this is a good way to make it fun and encourage them to try other things. If you have a child, child reader who is kind of stuck in a rut and only wants to read one kind of book, this is a good fun way to get them to try new things. And it's good for adults to do as well. You can do activities that tie into a story that something the characters did. Uh, I've noticed lately a lot of books have recipes that come with them. Uh, you can do arts and crafts inspired by the book, either things characters did in the book or inspired by the illustration style of the book. You can pair fiction and nonfiction books on the same topic. And um, BookFlix is an online resource that many libraries provide that does this for you. And and the program will actually will show the child the illustrations and the text and read read it to the child and they can follow along or they can read it for themselves. You can pick how much assistance you want with that. So that's a great resource. Uh, you can write different authors. Some authors will even Skype with classrooms for free or for a very small fee. So encouraging them to research authors of books they like and try to get in contact with them. And some authors are better than others about this. But anything that gets them to interact with the story and make it more meaningful will encourage them to read more. Uh, your local library, your public library, and your school library can help. They can provide reading lists. Um, public libraries often have service for teachers to provide additional materials to supplement uh, their classroom materials and school library materials for their curriculum. And they often do this for homeschooling families as well, so keep that in mind. Your uh, children's library staff is always happy to milk make recommendations and help you select appropriate books. Um, there, don't forget about ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, uh, graphic novels, and uh, see book librarian service if you need more extensive help and you want someone's undivided attention for a while, you can actually make an appointment where the librarian can sit down with you and they might gather some materials in advance to go over. Uh, if you look on your library's website, you can find many databases and more that can be helpful. You can check out digital resources like ebooks and audio e audiobooks and magazines. There are uh, things to to learn languages. You can there's encyclopedias and other things to look up information and resources. So check those out. And then of course your library programs. There are 
story times for younger kids. There are often, you know, book clubs for older kids or, you know, any program that they are interested in. We have libraries have theme programs with science and technology, arts and crafts, anything that they're interested in, they'll get them in the library and maybe you can convince them to check out a book or two while they're there. And don't forget your school libraries and librarians and advocate for your school library and school librarians. Some children may not ever get a chance to go to a public library. They may not live close enough one. Their parents may be too busy to ever take them. Their school library may be their only exposure and access to library materials. Every school needs a library. It needs to be open. They need to have a full-time librarian. And I appreciate you know the volunteers that help out with many and it's great that they donate their time but you need a trained professional librarian to help build collections and support the curriculum and help children pick out books so please advocate for funding and staffing your school libraries all right, and that is all I have. And I end with this quote from Dr. Seuss, the more that you read, the more things you will know, and the more that you learn, the more places you'll go. So just please, if you don't take anything else away from this, please remember that allowing kids to choose their books is the single greatest thing you can do to encourage reading and help them build a positive association for reading. And having a positive attitude about reading is the most important. If they don't have a positive attitude about reading, they are not going to read. So I hope you found this helpful. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Or you may email me um, at adventuresinstorytime at gmail.com or reach me through my blog, um, Adventures in Storytime and Beyond, which is at adventuresinstorytime.com. So thank you for listening and happy reading.